talking about these issues. So I think this is a fantastic turnout and uh, look forward to a, a very interesting and positive event. So I'll move on. Um, this is uh, what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about knowledge action change because you may actually be sitting there wondering who, who are not knowledge action change. I'm going to be talking about the kind of work we do and why we're here. Why are we here in uh, Nairobi uh, and why now? And then I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about what is harm reduction and how harm reduction may be relevant to smoking and to tobacco. So Knowledge Action Change, we're an organisation and essentially we're promoting health through harm reduction. Um, and we focus on harm reduction as one of the main strategies of uh, moving the agenda forward, providing people with the information so that they can make healthier life choices. Um, and a phrase that we use about the way we work is that we're nudging the conversation along. Uh, sometimes when you've got people that are, have got uh, real disagreements about the way things work, if you just argue head on, often you just entrench the other person within their views and you'll become more entrenched in yours. And we're just trying to open the conversation with as many stakeholders as we can and just to nudge that conversation along and make it an open discussion rather than an aggressive debate. Some of the work streams that we uh, carry out as an organisation, um, one of our major events is the Global Forum on Nicotine, which is a, an annual event, and we're just coming up to our sixth uh, conference. Uh, this takes place in Warsaw, in Poland, in uh, June every year. And some of the scholars uh, I'm responsible for the scholarship program at KAC, and the scholars will be invited along to uh, the GFN uh, to receive an induction in harm reduction because people will be at different stages of understanding exactly what it is. Um, and the opportunity to hear from some of the world's experts and to network with those people over four to five days and uh, come away with uh, some interesting contacts and hopefully some very interesting learning. And the conference is attended by policymakers, academics, medical professionals. One of the most important uh, constituencies there is consumers. We have a lot of consumer representation because we feel that consumers need to have a voice as well. We can't just have conversations going, going on about people's lives without hearing uh, from the consumers themselves. Nothing about us without us, as they say. And of course, public health officials who are very important because they often set the agenda and set the policies for local health initiatives. And as I said uh, when I was speaking to the first slide, what we're aiming at here is nudging that conversation along. Uh, another work stream which I won't say too much about is that. Uh, production of the uh, annual report. This is the first one, the one that you got when you uh, came in. Uh, that's the first annual report. Um, and we're looking at ways of enriching that as we move forward, uh, getting greater input from uh, individuals and organisations in different countries. Uh, but it's an annual stock take of tobacco harm reduction worldwide. And we'll be hearing more about that uh, later in the programme. Uh, this is the part of the uh, business that I oversee, scholarships, and the first scholarships were last year, and we're aiming to build capacity and competence amongst researchers, communicators, advocates, to develop and promote the evidence base, because it's all very well scientists knowing what the evidence base is. We want people to know that evidence base so they can make healthy choices for themselves. Uh, it's in its second year, just coming up to its second year. Uh, I may say a little bit more about it later, but essentially this, last year we had uh, 15 scholars, 
two of which were from Africa, and they both happened to be from Malawi, uh, because they were the only Africans that we had from Africa. Very different story this year, which I shall come on to uh, in a second. But we're looking at improving the implementation and the understanding of tobacco harm reduction and the personal choices that people can make. We also uh, operate something called Nicotine Science and Policy, which is an online daily digest of news, research, press, etc., from all over the world. So uh, if any of you uh, are interested in signing up for that, if you follow the uh, address there, and I think the slides will be made available to you later, so uh, feel free to write it down, but hopefully you'll get copies of these slides later so you can uh, choose or not to sign up to that. And we also run uh, a series of events, dialogue events, uh, etc., but also an annual conference, City Health International, uh, which is looking at how pretty much local areas rather than countries, so cities perhaps, uh, might work across agendas. So you've got health agendas, education agendas, planning agendas, etc. And it's how you can work across those agendas rather than within the silos to try and promote the health of a city. And it particularly focuses on uh, urban environments and it's uh, it's almost coincidental that this one's in the UK, so this year it's going to be in Liverpool, but it's actually a, a conference which uh, moves around uh, the world. I think last year it was in Ukraine. So why are we here? Well, I've explained the work streams that we have, uh, and this initiative for us links two of those work streams and possibly a few little bits of other work streams together quite closely. So we've got the Global State of Harm Reduction Report, No Fire, No Smoke, which is in front of you. And as part of our funding to produce this report, we are um, tasked with uh, offering seven launches around the world. Um, and I'll come on to why we chose to do it in uh, Africa in a second. So we're looking at, we've got the scholarship there, building research and information sharing capacity. And one of the scholars from Malawi last year, as part of his project, said that he was going to run an event for various stakeholders to come and hear uh, of the progress of his project. And as I say, there were two scholars in Malawi, and they got their heads together and thought, well, actually, let's do a joint event to show both of our scholarships, try and widen the debate out in Malawi. And um, they contacted me and said, can we have a few copies of the Global State Report to disseminate to the participants? 25 copies or so. And uh, so we thought, yes, that'd be a good idea, but how about, how would you feel if we bought the whole Global State Roadshow uh, and all of the resources behind the KAC, uh, particularly around communications, not that Malawi needed much help around communications, to be honest, um, and run the events here in Malawi, in Lilongwe, which we did last week. To get to Lilongwe from the UK, you have to come through Nairobi, change at Nairobi, fly on to the long way. And we've been speaking to Joseph and we'd come across a lot of Joseph's work anyway. So we contacted Joseph and said, we'd also like to run a roadshow in Nairobi. So you're getting two for the price of one, if you like, across Africa. Um, and I think that there's a real, we're at a point now where there's a real impetus and a, and a um, critical mass building in Africa, and I think that's represented, uh, demonstrated by the numbers of people that are here today. As Magu said earlier to me outside, you know, it's been difficult to get four or five people together. So, as I said last year, we had two scholars from Africa, from Malawi. This year, we've got five scholars from Malawi. But we've also got two scholars from Kenya, 
two from Nigeria, one of whom is here, you've just heard from him, from him too, and one from Ghana. And they'll each be receiving uh, a stipend of $10,000 this year to uh, carry out their projects. Who last year worked to a stipend of $7,500. This year we're asking them to do much more ambitious projects for $25,000 each. So particularly in low and middle income countries, that kind of money can go an awful long way. So harm reduction, what is it? Well, it's got its use, uses in all aspects of life. And essentially, it's about pragmatism. It's recognizing that there are behaviors that people will do, whatever the policy says, whether it's illegal, legal, I mean, drugs is a good example, drugs are illegal, but people still do it. And it's a pragmatic response, looking at how we can help those people to make healthier choices. Recognizing that people will engage in risky behaviors. And there are some practical issues. Speed limits is a harm reduction. Uh, agreeing to drive on the left rather than just having a free fall is a harm reduction measure. We don't say let's ban cars because we have accidents. We look at ways to make them safer. We introduce seat belts to cars. That's a harm reduction measure. And then we move on to what we more traditionally think of as harm reduction now, although the last time I was in Kenya in 1990, it didn't look very much like harm reduction when I remember there being draconian posters all over the place about HIV and AIDS, very stigmatizing posters. But it kind of came of age with the global emergence of HIV and AIDS epidemics across the world and led to such initiatives as methadone maintenance treatments and syringe exchange to try and draw people into treatments and give them the information about making those healthier choices and give them the, the equipment to be able to, if they are going to use. Uh, we have, in the UK, we have what we call naloxone distribution. And naloxone is pretty much an antidote to heroin and other opiates. So if somebody overdoses, if you can get to them quick enough and inject them with naloxone, it will wipe out the effects of the opiates pretty much immediately. And things like condom distribution. And we've got those networks around the world now. We've got those networks in Kenya, perhaps we might hear from James later on in the day uh, about some of that work. And some of the harm reduction work we want to do about tobacco and smoking can maybe piggyback on some of those interventions. And then we move on to tobacco harm reduction. So we've got, yes, e-cigarettes. But they're very expensive. They're very fiddly. Uh, they need constant supplies of electricity, etc. So that's one harm reduction measure. But there are other harm reduction measures. Uh, and we'll hear more of these later. But snus, which is a, a Swedish uh, processed tobacco uh, that people put in their mouths between their teeth and gums. And uh, its main use is in Scandinavia, and Sweden's one of the great examples. It has the lowest smoking rate in the world, and that's largely due to the uptake of snus. So people still consume tobacco and nicotine, but they're not smoking. And then there are traditional uh, uh, things such as uh, nicotine gum nicotine patches and sprays and inhalers which will help people to uh, move away from combustible smoking. This is a very simple uh, diagram of what harm reduction is. So on the left hand side we've got harm, chaos, risky behaviours and many approaches to public health would like us to move immediately from that straight across to the right hand side. Safety abstinence. Just don't do it. Unfortunately, as I've been saying earlier, people will continue to do things. And harm reduction is about moving people along that continuum as far as they can go and as far as they are willing to go at this present moment. Later on, they may change their mind and move a little bit further forward, but we're giving them the information and uh, equipment to help them move along that continuum. 
and it's all about knowledge. So, harm reduction and smoking, harm reduction and tobacco. Nicotine is not the problem. It's smoking. It's setting fire to your cigarette, lighting your cigarette. That's what's causing the, uh, the, the problems of uh, tobacco. And there's a, a phrase which is banded around the tobacco harm reduction world, which is people smoke for the nicotine, but they die for the tar. Nicotine itself, contrary to what a lot of even uh, medical professionals think, is not carcinogenic. It's fairly innocuous. No more dangerous, really, than the coffee that we had on the way in, the caffeine. And I've talked about the variety of options that we have for reducing it, but you may add into that just education, getting, getting good information out to people. It's 95% safer than smoking. So yes, there's still that 5%, but I'd far rather see the population 95% safer than just a few people managing to achieve abstinence. It recognises that people often cannot or will not quit smoking, but essentially it saves lives. Thank you for your time.